Thank you very much, Tim. And uh, it's a, a real pleasure to be here. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today and pay my respects to Elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge my parliamentary colleagues and uh, distinguished guests, one and all. I'd especially like to make mention of the fact that my mum and dad are in the audience today. And uh, we talked about the family farm and the, and the fact that I'm standing here today and uh, a large part of the reason that I've got the confidence and uh, the capacity to be in the role that I'm in today comes from the fact that I uh, grew up in a very well supported family in a small town called Wild Catcham. And uh, they taught me everything I needed to know to get my way through life and it's lovely to have them in the audience today. So welcome everyone. Just before I start, um, I will make a short comment around uh, women in, in agriculture. I flew up to Dalwollanew yesterday to open the women's group Leiby Field Day and my message to my message to the women, about 150 of them, including students from Kandata Nag and Mora Agricultural School, was that um, women tend to be hardwired to step back until they feel like they can take on roles and do them 100%. Um, it's, it, there's plenty of research uh, surrounding this phenomenon and, and my message to the women in the room was that I think, without doubt, women in agriculture are some of the best voices that we have for this sector. And when they get the opportunity, they need to lean in, step forward and take that opportunity because unlike our male counterparts who might be known to uh, bluff it until they get it, um, we do tend to step outside. And that's why we have um, less, less representation at some of those leadership, uh, in some of those leadership roles across the sector and we desperately need them as we move into the next 100 years of agriculture in Western Australia. So, um, I always get asked about the gender and, and sometimes the age when I, when I take on, on these roles to speak at, at events and I have to say that um, as a younger member of parliament and a female uh, among my colleagues I never feel like I'm uh, uh, being singled out or am, uh, my opinion is, is less valued and, and I think that's something that just by the very virtue of having members um, in the room at the cabinet table um, and being able to walk into a room and talk to students from Cunderdon Agri Agricultural College and, and more Agricultural College, just demonstrating that, that it can be done and giving them a little bit of uh, inspiration is one of the nicest parts of my job. But I'm here today to talk about seizing the opportunity for agriculture and I'd like to preface the uh, comments I'm going to make is uh, uh, today about the fact that WA has been preparing to seize the opportunity in agriculture for some time. The China and uh, Southeast Asia food boom and the investment and trade deals that are now being finalised almost on a weekly basis have not caught us by surprise. Before the last state election of March 2013, my colleagues and I recognised that not only did the agricultural sector need a financial boost, but we needed to start changing some of the settings to meet the demand that was growing on our doorstep. But before the last state election, the Nationals promised a $300 million investment package funded through royalties for regions to underpin the sector. And it was directed into, uh, into areas like boosting grains research and biosecurity, targeting investment in infrastructure to unblock supply chains, developing the northern beef herd, identifying sustainable water to expand irrigation, establishing a sheep industry development centre and investing in our grassroots grower groups to support meaningful research and development. And given recent talk about the uh, overdue renaissance in agriculture, you would have seen that as the editorial in the West a couple of days ago, and the almost daily interest from the private sector and opportunity, it seems unlikely that a policy that was geared to these settings and potentially delivering the biggest investment from the state government into agriculture in its history in this state, that the policy would have its detractors. But it did. And I might add that while this election commitment is now locked in and fully supported by our Liberal National Alliance, I'm still fielding questions from some of our farm-based publications on why we've got the settings wrong. So today I'm going to tell you why we've got it right. So thank you, Cedar, for the opportunity to talk about something that's very close to my heart. Seizing the opportunity is an excellent, in agriculture is an excellent billing for today's event because it is a salient reminder of the global village in which all export-oriented countries now compete. We have a glowing history of success in the fiercely competitive resources sector and are now suppliers of choice to China and Japan. Buyer countries 
like China and Japan, are often major shareholders in our resource companies to shore up their own supply positions. We must now, we must now apply the same principles of investment, market reliability and innovation to the agricultural sector. We're all aware of the opportunities, but we are just one of a group of countries that are now competing for a slice of the export market. The United States, Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina and Canada are not only competitors in food products like grain and beef, but they are also in the business of luring foreign investment into their agricultural projects. Having the market invest in your export business is to mitigate risk. Foreign investment and partnerships in the supply chain will be critical to helping the sector reach its full, full productive potential. Everyone in this room today, I'm sure, will be aware of at least some of the many fascinating statistics around the growth of China and Southeast Asia and the rising demand for safe and quality and reliable food supply. To put things into context, just before coming in here today, I had a look at a website called geohive.com and I'd encourage you to go and have a look at it. It really, it's very interesting. And it predicts world population statistics collected by the United Nations Population Division. It informed me that today, Friday the 20th of June, there are 7.321 billion people on our planet. Incredibly, that's 215,000 more than yesterday. It also told me that China this Friday has a population of 1.393 billion people, 23,000 more people to feed than yesterday. And that India has 1.27 billion people and growing at a staggering rate of just over 42,000 people per day. In case you were wondering, Australia on this day has 23.6 million people with a daily increase of 839 people. Not quite comparable. By 2050, the global population is expected to reach 9.55 billion people. It's little wonder to anybody in this room that food security is at the forefront of national policy and planning in countries that rely on food imports. How to feed the masses is core business for an increasing number of governments. Western Australia can be part of the long-term food solution, but only if we dramatically increase and expand our production. And that means creating opportunities for irrigation across the state by finding the water, resolving land tenure barriers, and providing export infrastructure as required. In WA, we must embrace irrigation and it needs to be at a scale far beyond the estimated 50,000 hectares we currently irrigate today. The state's 2008 water strategy estimated that there were 10 million hectares suitable for irrigated agriculture in Western Australia, half of which is in the West Kimberley. Our current 50,000 hectares are just a tiny part of the 2 million hectares irrigated nationally, with 1.2 million of that in the Murray-Darling Murray Basin. Compare that with the 29 million hectares in the United States of America. To create a vision for agriculture irrigation in Western Australia, we must look to the past and we must ask ourselves why we irrigate just 50,000 hectares. Is it that we need bulletproof markets to justify spending our own money on expensive irrigation infrastructure? Is it because we've resisted foreign investment in the farm sector, even though it can mitigate risk? Is it because creating irrigation precincts in the north are at the mercy of approvals processes, including native title? It's probably a combination of all three. Why is it then that the resources sector has been able to adapt, deal with the hurdles and flourish in a high risk environment? Why is it that the resources sector has worked so seamlessly with foreign investment and created such strong supply chains for their product? Over the next four years, I'll be leading a program called Water for Food, a $40 million investment through Royalties for Regions to turbocharge groundwater investigation across WA, and it's a key component of the WA government seizing the opportunity program. Clearly, one of our greatest opportunities to create new food production centres is the underdeveloped rangelands where 452 parcel leases cover nearly 87 million hectares, or 34% of our state. It's a new frontier for irrigation because many pastoral stations in the Kimberley, Pilbara and Gascoyne overlay large freshwater resources. Additionally, there are vast tracts of unallocated crown land waiting to be developed. 
The Department of Water estimates that there are more than 1,000 gigalitres of sustainable fresh water in the Kimberley and Pilbara alone. Accessing it requires a journey through approvals, including native title, environmental assessment and significant capital investment. And we need to clear these hurdles with a sense of urgency. While Western Australia has identified markets and signed a number of memorandums of understanding to send more beef into China, Indonesia, Vietnam and other Southeast Asian markets, we need more on-farm irrigation to mitigate seasonal supply issues. I applaud the bold move by Andrew Forrest to acquire Harvey Beef, the state's only processor licensed for the China market, and his vision for Mindaroo Station and his other pastoral holdings in the rangelands. And I also welcome the vision of the Kimberley Aboriginal leader, Wayne Bergman, and his team. They're setting up a framework for a mosaic irrigation along the Fitzroy Valley to help Aboriginal stations lift their combined herd from its current 25,000 to 25,000 head to 100,000 head. And while beef is a primary target, they are also interested in land tenure changes that broaden the economic base of their stations and allow for the creation of irrigation precincts for high value food crops for export. I met with Wayne recently when I was in the Kimberley and I told him he has my full support. I also support the aspirations of Liveringa and Gogo stations also on the Fitzroy River and their plans to expand irrigation in the state. Half of all the Kimberley pastoral stations are now in Aboriginal hands and many of them are strategically placed along the uh, Fitzroy River and its tributaries. There is an opportunity of a lifetime to engage with Aboriginal pastoralists, traditional owners and Indigenous leaders like Wayne to negotiate partnerships and pathways to lift the productivity in the Kimberley. There are good reasons for an urgent approach to irrigated agriculture in the rainlands, especially for the beef market. According to the US Department of Agriculture attaché in Beijing, China's beef imports this year could climb to 550,000 tonnes, up from 400,000 tonnes in 2013. Just recently, my ministerial colleague Terry Redman was in Hainan to witness an MOU between the Australian government and the Hainan government on beef trade. Rob Delane, who's in the audience and is part of the panel discussion this afternoon, was also in China to see the signing of three MOUs on beef. And Rob is on the record as saying China's demand could far exceed the 100,000 head a year, making it the second biggest live market behind Indonesia. So the question to the room is, does Western Australia have the capacity to supply beef product where and when the market wants it? We know that India is now one of the world's leading red meat exporters from its 327 million head of buffalo and has already signed an MOU with China. We know Brazil is a major competitor in the food market, especially beef, from its 208 million head of cattle. Brazil currently exports 2 million tonnes of beef, live and processed, much of it already into Hong Kong. And nationally, in Australia, our beef cattle herd is estimated at around 25 million head with an estimated 12 million head in Queensland with numbers diminishing due to drought. Right now in Western Australia, less than 2 million head of beef cattle, half of which are in the northern rangelands exist. In 2011-12, the ABS estimated the gross value of beef, beef production in WA at $517 million. And there's often a gloomy outlook for the beef sector in WA. It's interesting to note, though, that domestically produced beef did not meet local demand, with large volumes of beef in 2012 having to be trucked in from the east. A dramatic expansion of WA's irrigation capability is one answer to creating critical mass maintaining quality and becoming export ready with the right product at the right time. Why would we not seize the opportunity through irrigation to turn more low value grasses in the rangelands into more high value export beef worth around $2,000 per tonne in the live market? As Minister for Water, it's my aspiration to identify sustainable water resources and create that opportunity. Create the opportunity for irrigation precincts to be established in the rangelands and elsewhere, not only for fodder and, and forage crops, but also for high value food, including, including corn and maize and beans and vegetables. Ideally, if you asked me into the future, my future, my, my ideal pastoral lease would not only run stock, but contain commercial scale irrigation islands where a diverse range of cash crops and high value food products could be grown alongside fodder. 
We have a unique opportunity to unlock the potential of our rangelands, but we can only do it by unlocking and tackling land tenure problems that have crippled our ability to, in, uh, to attract third party investment. While pastoralists currently can obtain permits to, to diversify parts of their uh, lease and irrigate pasture and other crops for pastoral use, direct third party investment in the permit area is currently prohibited and that must change. The Minister for Regional Development, Terry Redman and I are working on a pathway that we hope can liberate potentially hundreds of thousands of hectares of pastoral land for sustainable irrigation. If we are to be part of the solution to China and Southeast Asia's food challenge, then we must invite private capital to join us, just as we've done in the Ord. The rangelands really are the promised land when it comes to lifting the scale of production for nutrient-dense beef and other foods. In the West Kimberley, for example, we have many stations with access to the Fitzroy River, which has a mean annual flow of some 8,000 gigalitres a year. There's an estimated 200 gigalitres of sustainable supply in the alluvial gravels between Willier and Fitzroy Crossing. The, La the Lagrange aquifers south of Bruce, Broom are also overlain by pastoral leases and unallocated crown land and have estimated 50 gigalitres of year available. The West Canning Basin Sandfire Aquifer also has an estimated 50 gigalitres a year available, with some already licensed to irrigate fodder at Walal and Pardu stations. In the Pilbara, an estimated 240 gigalitres a year has been identified, including 160 gigalitres of mainly fresh water discharged from mines operating below the water table. Rio Tinto, to its great credit, has been a standard bearer in this area in the use of mine dewater and having established a 1,200 hectare agricultural precinct near Tom Price to produce fodder with part of its 30 gigalitre annual dewater licence for the Marindu iron ore mine, I'd encourage other businesses to be going down this pathway as well. The state government's actually funding a pilot program to grow fodder at Woody Woody Manganese Mine east of Marble Bar on the edge of the Great Sandy Desert using part of that mine's 60 gigalitres annual discharge licence. So while it wasn't my intention to uh, explode your head with statistics, I wanted to, to let you know the importance of the Water for Food project as our state moves from its reliance on the mining economy. Water for Food is a statewide program with groundwater investigation targets over the next four years, including areas in the West Kimberley, the Pilbara, the Gascoyne, the Midlands Wheatbelt, Manjimup Donnelly, Warren Donnelly Manjimup and the Wellington Mile Up areas. I've spoken at length about the opportunities that we have in our north, but among our aims will be unlocking the secret to lowering water salinity from the Wellington Reservoir near Collie, where an estimated 85 gigalitres a year is available to agriculture and industry. Lowering the salinity of that water body could be a game changer in that region, providing new high value agricultural opportunities for the Harvey and Mile Up irrigation districts. I recently launched a publication called Water for Growth that summarises the latest results from the state's groundwater investigations and it comes with a water resources inventory which for the first time ever, I think, we have a single atlas that shows our groundwater story so far, what's been allocated and what's available. And I have a responsibility as the Minister for Water to facilitate opportunities for industry and individuals who genuinely want to access irrigation water and are motivated to become bigger players in the export game. Andrew Forrest has put his skin in the game and I'm keen to see others follow. I'm keen to see more people like Jack Burton, for example, with his Yuta Beef brand in the north, who is currently completing a $20 million abattoir between Broome and Derby to process up to 55,000 head per year for the Singapore hamburger trade. I'm heartened by success stories like Greg and Peter Walsh with Bunbury Abattoirs, who have linked into a major China export play for beef and lamb. And I will do whatever I can do to smooth the path for private sector to access sustainable groundwater for irrigation to make sure that we're not left behind and that we can take every opportunity that this state has to offer. Ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be all about seizing the opportunity and I thank you and it's just wonderful to see a room full of people here to talk about the future of agriculture and I wish you well with your panel discussions this afternoon. Thank you very much.